But as the rain stops, the sun reflects on the yellow smoke, and several limping men come out of it, much to Smith's relief that his men are still up and going. The northerners have no regard for such a reunion and continue their gunfire. The movie begins in the year 1966, when Vietnam is in an all-out civil war, to the point of attracting international attention and warranting decisive action. Among these powers are Australia and New Zealand, collaborating with the United States and South Vietnam to combat the North's spread of communism in the Indochina region. The joint Oceanic States enlist young men to fend off a rather distinguished foe, fighting on and for their home turf, where there will only be bloodshed. On August 17, in Nui Dat, South Vietnam, stationed the 1st Australian Task Force where, in collaboration with the New Zealand Corps, they are bombarded by mortar fire by the joint forces of the North Vietnamese People's Army and the Viet Cong from the surrounding tropical jungles. The guesswork of calibers and coordinates of the source of incoming fire takes place to determine a counterattack, as the camp intermittently receives bombardment from the enemy. The bearings of the mortar fire are yet to be determined. However, several artillerymen are too busy playing cards rather than defending their base despite aggravation by their superiors. While the triangulations are calculated in the command center, two privates on guard converse without concern for the attack. Demonstrating their battlefield inexperience makes one of them fail to maintain trigger discipline. Thus, gunshot echoes within the camp, confusing other soldiers on guard to fire on nothing. An infuriated major back in the command center takes notice of this and orders his inferiors to find out the source of it. With the bearings made, the men in charge of the ordnance finally adjust their guns toward their targets. Firing their shots, their howitzers vastly outgun their enemies, who are annihilated by the bombardment. The following day, as repairs to the base and the relocation of casualties is being made, the colonel in command Colin Townsend enumerates their losses and the men of two company commanders regarding their statuses. One of them, Major Harry Smith, volunteers his company, Delta, for the incoming operation. Still, he shows disinterest in the colonel, given their differences in leadership. Smith is a veteran from the Malayan campaign 11 years prior, and his vast experience is evident. Recalling the private who fired a stray shot the night previous, Paul Larch, he tries to earn his trust by strangulating him for his insolent behavior and not shooting him afterward. That night, he tells the brigadier in command, Oliver Jackson, that his talents are wasted in his brigade and wishes to be relocated elsewhere. Unfortunately, the commanding officer doesn't allow him, asserting that his dislike of the colonel is irrelevant, lacking qualities that would validate his transfer to better command. The following day on August 18, the performance troupe of Colonel Joy and the Joy Boys is flown into the camp to entertain the soldiery. Miss Patty is one of the performers known closely by Private Large, and he tells her to kiss his companion, Private Noel Grimes, on the cheek as a gesture for being her top fan. Both tried to attend the concert but being under Smith's company, they couldn't do so. The show commences while Smith's Delta Company marches into the rubber plantations of Long Tan and splits into three platoons, 10th, 11th, and 12th. After Lt. Gordon Sharp reports meeting contact with the enemy to Smith, they chase the enemy into a hut deep into the jungle. They search in the hut for combatants until they realize that they've been led into a trap, where the northern Vietnamese ambush their position with machine gun fire. With the platoon caught off guard, some are killed by this encounter, and the men are pinned down. Sharp reports heavy enemy fire to Smith and prompts the 10th to back them up while the 12th links up with HQ, Smith's group. The report brings Colonel Townsend, who attended the concert but is readily reminded of his duties, to call for the brigadier. Sharp also reports coordinating an artillery barrage as the joint Vietnamese force encircles the 11th parameter. A hail of shells rains down on them. Reminding everyone else back at base that there's no enjoyment in war, distant explosions reach the task force's concert as it concludes. Miss Patty's gratitude for her audience is taken no heed by the troops exiting the show. Brigadier Jackson arrives at headquarters to be briefed about the situational report of Delta Company, who discards the situation as capably under control by Smith's men. Along the way, the 10th engages in contact, delaying relief for the 11th, losing communication in the fight, they are forced to be immobilized despite heavy fire. Sharp requests one more battery barrage as his last when a bullet tears through his throat, ending him. Communications are then taken over by Private Grimes, as he tells Smith about 11th being low on ammo and Sharp's untimely death. Shells fly, 
and so does a chopper as it loads Miss Patty's troop for evacuation. The shells land once more, and hearing the sound of a bugle, the northern Vietnamese retreat, leaving the 11th to be spared for now. The little victory is reported back to Smith when the 12th finally arrives. Still, a harbinger from the 10th says that his platoon is in a similar trajectory to the 11th. With this information, Private Large tasks himself with a daunting journey to head out for the 11th to scout the situation without the Major's knowledge. The 11th tries to recover, but sniper fire from the hut and a cacophony of a bugle, gunfire, and war cries surrounds the lone platoon. Back at the Task Force Command Center, Jackson is met by Smith broadcasting his estimate of belligerence. The Brigadier's initial estimate is a platoon, a handful of men. Still, the approximate numbers are a battalion, way in the hundreds. Firearms and air support are requested by the Major, but the Brigadier only grants air support through Group Captain Peter Raw, as it's his jurisdiction. The battery ceases fire at Nui Dat as three jets dash over. Hearing the loud thundering booms of jet engines, Sergeant Bob Buick is tasked to throw a smoke signal to alert the requested air support to bombard the area. Unfortunately, the smoke grenade fails to pop off, forcing the planes to drop their ordnance on a location far away from the skirmish. The three jets are also the only air support available, leaving the 11th no choice but to fend off themselves. Decimated and next to no ammo, Buick requests a battery assault to barrage their perimeter, given that they're flanked on all sides without any escape. But, as blasts surround Buick and Smith's comms are met with static, the downpours from the sky send Delta melancholic. Meanwhile, Large has returned to HQ from his voyage, hoping to still secure the 11th platoon. But without knowledge of the barrage, his mates are telling him to despair as he learns that the 11th is no more. He mistakes Smith's order for a barrage as his own doing, accusing Smith of being selfish and how he doesn't care about losing an entire platoon of men, making him lose his trust in the Major. Driven to tears, Smith tries to stand his private down, but HQ is suddenly ambushed by the Northerners. The Major calls to use the armored personnel vehicles left on standby to relieve Delta, especially the 11th, but Brigadier Jackson dismisses him, claiming that there's no longer an 11th. Colonel Townsend relays Major Smith's company that he will not be reinforced and is to retreat from Long Tan. Awaiting confirmation of their new objective, the Colonel's orders receive insubordination from his inferior under the supervision of his own superior, humiliating him and his management. Smith implies to his colonel that the only way they'll return to the base will be in body bags if they continue treating their men as cannon fodder. Delta tasks themselves to find the 11th, wherein Smith takes Private Large with him to the last known location of the platoon while commanding one of his officers to link up with the 10th, recalling that they don't have a radio, he also sends one soldier to deliver communication back to the 10th to make the link up easier. Underneath the rain, Smith requests the task force headquarters for ammunition. However, Townsend rejects him, repeating his initial order to retreat into the base. The Major is too persistent in saving his men and will not budge under the threat of a court-martial if it means having a chance of rescuing his platoon. However, Group Captain Raw unauthorized Smith's requests due to foul weather and unviable landing zones. On the other hand, Flight Lieutenant Frank Riley has authority over his aircraft. Therefore, he decides to do the supply run with a fellow Flight Lieutenant. Meanwhile, the soldier tasked with delivering comms to the 10th was a success, finally establishing back communication with HQ. Low on ammo, they retreat for the link-up as the 10th begins to move for the first time since losing communications. Back at the base, the duo of flight officers begins packing their aircraft munitions with another chopper for the company back in Long Tan and are tasked to do it under heavy rain and enemy anti-aircraft fire. The two helicopters await Delta's signal while they move into position. As Smith's men pop a smoke grenade, under anti-aircraft fire and without a secure landing zone, the air supply force is forced to drop crates of ammo and aid on the given position. Tumbling down on the forest floor, the soldiers gather what they can to hold out against hostilities until they find the 11th platoon. Resupplying then drags them closer to the 11th last known position. Still, they meet in contact with the northern Vietnamese, hindering Delta's rescue mission. Being unable to take in more casualties, the relief force holds its ground and throws a smoke signal towards the area by the hut to signal the 11th that friendlies are near their position. Awaiting any response but met only by gunfire from the skirmish, they begin to doubt if coming here is worth the expense. But as the rain stops, the sun reflects on the yellow smoke, and several limping men come out of it, 
much to Smith's relief that his men are still up and going. The Northerners have no regard for such a reunion and continue their gunfire. Meanwhile, after relaying to Task Force Headquarters the news of the 11th platoon being relieved, Colonel Townsend now agrees to Smith's proposal of bringing in the armored units to reinforce them. However, Brigadier Jackson reminds him that he has intelligence reports regarding the Nui Dat camp being possibly surrounded by a more significant force of North Vietnamese that can easily overwhelm their low numbers. Townsend rebuffs him by stating that if Smith's given enough time to hold, taking the fight against the Northern Vietnamese will secure them both defense and victory. Eventually, the brigadier changes his mind but warns the colonel of the consequences of his conduct. While the APCs load up and drive for Long Tan, Delta licks their wounds underneath the jungle cover. They are given an hour to hold before the APCs arrive, without much disagreeing with that notion. However, the task force base is ordered to be on the defensive while the northern Vietnamese begin their charge. Colonel Townsend then excuses himself from Jackson to examine the task force defense, but he requests that one of the APCs turn back to pick him up and bring him to the field. Meanwhile, Delta holds its position, with assistance from the batteries back in the base as the northern Vietnamese charge. The APCs are taking too long for their established arrival time. Thus, Private Grimes requests a dangerously close artillery barrage toward their position. Perhaps it was too close, as Grimes cries back to cease fire. Communication with headquarters is halted when lightning strikes the base's radio antenna. Delta prepares to make one last stand as the APCs are yet to arrive, reinforcing them as they meet contact against the northern Vietnamese. Quiet dawns the rubber plantation, driving Delta anxious for the carnage yet to come. While on the wait, Smith converses with Large regarding their personal lives, where Large reveals his desire to be married upon his return to Australia, followed by Smith showing him a picture of his wife. They then hear faint shouts of fierce northern Vietnamese jungle warriors. Still, Delta assures themselves of standing up against a relentless enemy whose war cries only grow closer. Grimes continually contacts headquarters until an emergency line is provided, as their coordinates are written down for one final barrage. As more drop dead, even more enemies come charging on toward Delta. The northern Vietnamese attacked in great numbers and overwhelmed their small number, on the verge of total annihilation. Conserving ammo until the very last moment, Delta tries to make every shot count. Finally, the northerners breach their perimeter. In the process, Large is caught off guard and is headshot by a charging northern combatant. Smith, unable to handle yet another loss, becomes berserk, holding a pistol against a multitude of armed men, and continues to be overwhelmed by an unrelenting enemy. Not even intermittent barges of howitzer shells will stop the northern menace as they run and run towards the oceanic parameter. Ranged combat becomes melee and some resort to knives and rifles used as clubs. Suddenly, gunfire coming behind Smith strikes the charging foe, forcing him to duck down as reinforcements of APCs finally arrive. The northern Vietnamese army flee as men are overpowered by machine. Smith pants as he views his dead comrades and reports their victorious defense to headquarters, albeit at great expense. Hearing this makes even Brigadier Jackson, a man of staunch command, tremble, knowing that there are no winners in war, only survivors. At the field, Colonel Townsend congratulates Smith, who takes it indifferently. And on August 19th, the following morning, an officer roll calls the remaining soldiers. A carnage of death litters the jungle floor without regard for either side. The movie ends as Australians and New Zealanders transport their deceased men by helicopters, to be grieved by their families and their countries for a service they were pulled into on land considered home by their foe. War takes out the worst in men by dying at the command of the other and protecting one's country. It is a principle that they believe in, for the sole fact that bodies have to pile up to win wars. Both sides claim victory in the battles they've fought, only to lose in the war they waged, one way or another. To wage war is to disrespect the living, but to forget it is to dishonor those who died in it. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more videos like this to help the channel out. Have a nice day.